The Revelation of St. John, the last book of the Christian New Testament, stands apart kind of on its own when you compare it to the other books found in the New Testament because it doesn't fit quite as neatly in with the other categories uh, that we've described throughout that portion of the Bible. Uh, in fact, the Revelation of St. John mirrors mostly what we find in the Old Testament, particularly in the works of the prophets, especially the work of the prophet Daniel. Um, the word revelation uh, is a translation of the Greek word apocalypse. Um, the, the official title of this book is the Apocalypse of St. John. Um, An apocalypse means to reveal or to make known. When we hear the word apocalypse, particularly in our, our, our modern day, our mind goes to jump toward the end of the world, right? The, the, the things that come on the last days. And that's primarily because of our collective fascination with this last book of the New Testament. Um, when you think about the apocalypse, right, in the way that our culture does, you think of, uh, I, I think primarily in, in terms of movies, and so we think of like Independence Day where, you know, aliens come and destroy the world, or you think of uh, other uh, movies like uh, the, the 2012, right? Um, it was a movie about a natural disaster, or uh, The Day After Tomorrow, another uh, movie about natural disasters where the entire world is transformed almost in an instant uh, to the point where it's this uh, cataclysmic level of damage done to creation. And that's not really what apocalypse means, right? Because if apocalypse means to reveal or to make known, the purpose of the entire book of Revelation is to describe something that has been revealed or made known to its author who is St. John. Um, this seems to be a different John than the one who wrote the Gospel of John and the three letters of John. Um, this John uh, was a Christian who was um, living in the midst of a persecuted church, probably sometime around the years um, 90 to 100 AD. And because of the persecution that he himself uh, endured as a member of, and a leader in the church, was exiled to an island called Patmos, which is off um, the coast of Crete, which is um, in the neighborhood of where Greece is. And so while John was in exile on Patmos, he received this vision, this revelation. Um, it came to him either as part of a dream or over the course of uh, several times uh, in his life of prayer, um, as he reflected on the state of the world and prayed for God to show him how um, God was working in that world. Uh, this revelation, this thing that God revealed to John, um, was made known to him and then recorded by him in the form that we have it now today. Um, and, and so when you look to and read the book of Revelation, it's not intended to be a roadmap for our future. Um, much in the same way that the prophetic writings had uh, visions and prophecies and explanations about the world in which um, the prophets were living, right, 23, 24, 2500 years ago, and visions and prophecies and revelations about the future, given the course of events moving forward and our trust in God's activity in it, the book of Revelation does a lot of the same things. There are things in the book of Revelation that would primarily pertain only to John's day, now 1900 years ago or so. Um, and there are some things that as Christians who hope for the final coming of Jesus and the restoration of all creation, we can look and say that those things are still yet to be found in our future. And so when we come to and we read a book like that, it's very, very important that we're diligent in how we approach it. Because if we think that everything has to do with our future, we can miss some of what God is already doing in our present. And if we think that it all has to do with the world in which we're living now, 
um, especially in the way that our our surrounding world thinks about apocalypse and all of that doomsday stuff, then we can miss the beauty and the hope and the fulfillment of what God does and what God has promised through this particular Christian witness that we call the book of Revelation. And so I say all of that to say that it's it's very important when we turn to the book of Revelation that we do so in the presence of a Christian community, just as it's important to do that with all of the other texts of Scripture. Um, it's passed down and it's intended for a Christian community, uh, the, the people of God. And so as the people of God, it is our duty to faithfully and diligently and carefully look to those texts in such a way that it honors the original intent and points to ultimately not the destruction of the world or our place in it or eternal suffering and and all that kind of stuff that we focus on and that makes Revelation such really kind of a scary book to read but that we focus on what God is doing how God is making moves in the world to bring the world to its final culmination of peace, of wholeness, of life all of these things made known in the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and so when, when John uh, starts the book of Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to his servant, John. So this revelation, what has been made known, is all about Jesus. And the way that that gets carried out and the way that that gets recorded is through what's called apocalyptic imagery. Um, the, the people, the places, the events, the things that happen in this book um, aren't intended to be taken literally. Like if you were to take the book of Revelation and make a movie out of it, you wouldn't do so in a way that um, you know uses CGI to make some of these. Uh, we'll, we'll take the the four-winged beast, right? The the one with the head of a lion, the one with the head of an ox, the one with the head of a human, and the one with the head of an eagle. You wouldn't put them on the screen in the way that they're described on the text because it's meant to be um, metaphor and allegory. It's something that has been revealed to John in a particular way that speaks to something beyond what it is. And so that's very important for us to understand because... In the years in which Revelation was recorded, as we said, John is uh, a persecuted servant of the church, and the church at whole is a persecuted church. They undergo great suffering and torment and threat of arrest and, and execution because they are Christian. And what what's beautiful about the work of Revelation and why it was included in this canon of Scripture isn't because it talks about the death and destruction of all of God's enemies and the enemies of God's people, right? The, the, the things that we think about when we think of uh, the final judgment and the final return of Jesus. It's kept and it's looked to as uh, a witness of our shared faith because at its core, Revelation is intended to bring a sense of comfort and reassurance to a persecuted church. In the first uh, three or four chapters of the book of Revelation, right, John introduces himself and then he records his first vision. And it's a vision uh, called the vision of the Son of Man. And if you read through that, you see all this imagery and he's talking about his image of Jesus in whatever this vision was and then addresses a letter to seven different churches and these seven Christian communities are spread throughout um, Asia Minor it's what's now considered Turkey and in this letter to these seven churches John takes this vision of the Son of Man and uses the different aspects of how Jesus is described to address what's going on in those seven churches. Um, one church seems to be um, facing persecution and suffering greatly for it. And his interpretation of that vision is that as this church community suffers, 
uh, they trust that in the in the presence of Jesus, who has been raised from the dead, um, they remain steadfast in the faith, much in the same way that we heard about in the pastoral and general epistles. Another church is facing persecution, and they are renouncing their faith. They're they're casting their belief in Jesus aside so that they can avoid the punishment or the threat of execution or death. And uh, John uses that vision that he received to uh, criticize that church and say, look, you are people who have been called and claimed by God, and that's not something that, be, that can be cast away lightly. And so look to this vision and be reminded of who God is and how God has claimed you and stick to the faith regardless of uh, what dangers your life may be in. And you know, other different circumstances in the life of those churches that John specifically addresses. Um, and so that, that's what sets the scene for uh, the other uh, eight, 17, 18, 19 chapters that follow. As John continues to record different visions and his experience of having those visions of uh, being drawn into heaven and led by a heavenly guide, an angel, so to say, um, being whisked away by the Spirit to see all of these things unfold, we get the sense that what John is recording is really about what it looks like to live as Christians in a world where the message, the good news of Jesus' resurrection from, from the dead is not accepted by everyone. And so you see this beautiful image, um, you know, interspersed with all of this judgment and torment and suffering and death of uh, all the saints, right? Uh, the, the Christians who have uh, died and rest now in Jesus, gathered under the heavenly altar. And they look up uh, to the presence of God from that space under the protection of an altar, right? The symbol of our worship. And uh, cry out to God, how long, O Lord, must we suffer, right? The persecuted church um, pleading to God for an end to this persecution, that God would, would provide comfort and justice and wholeness in spite of the brokenness of the world that has um, uh, used its power and used its influence against God's faithful people. And, and how then you know the response of God and the visions that come after talk about how God is bringing justice to that persecuted church um, another image right so you get this book uh, the, the scroll with seven seals on it right wax seals that would have kept it shut for its intended recipient so that they knew when they opened the scroll um, the message that was specifically for them uh, had been preserved for them and no one else had read it and so the the scroll comes and and John cries out you know in, in um, distress you know who can open this scroll who was this intended for and a lamb comes in right and we remember how Jesus is uh, described as the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the lamb opens the seals and as the seals are opened you see these four riders on horses come out and they bring with them um, you know uh, famine and plague and war and death and how what's unleashed uh, in the world as the result of Jesus' resurrection is a recoil against God's good gift of life right that, that when we experience in this life a sense of God's peace and a sense of God's joy and a sense of God's resurrection. Um, the the powers of this world that defy God, sin, death, and the devil, use these other tools of famine, of warfare, of plague, to inflict death upon the world. And the Lamb is there to unleash the other seals that bring about the um, redemption and the reconciliation of the world apart from those things. And I think the thing to remember about that particular you know, piece of this vision, that as we see uh, death and famine and warfare and plague surrounding us uh, in the vision, we, we can also look around 
in our modern day and see where warfare is still very prevalent and causes great uh, great levels of death and destruction in our world where plague and disease and illness continue to um, destroy families and lives and disrupt our way of life in a way that death follows suit um, and that you know hunger is still a very real problem even in a world where we are able to grow enough food to feed everyone yet so many people still die with empty bellies as they go to bed at night that the promise of healing and restoration and peace and wholeness come in spite of those things and so, you know, it, it's not just something that's waiting for this last day where we, we see it all happen and are in fear of it, but it's happening even right now. And so the promise that God is bringing life and restoration and wholeness into those places is also happening right now as God's people continue to live out in faithful witness to Jesus' resurrection, ministering to the sick, advocating for peace in places uh, and in relationships where anger and hostility arise by feeding those who are hungry and um, supporting the needs of the poor always pointing to the life that God offers in spite of death and its presence among us so then you come to this other image right uh, that that throughout the book of Revelation what when you encounter those jarring, scary, overwhelming images of death and destruction and chaos. Uh, there seems to be chapters thrown in almost, you know, to break that up, that, that cycle of death and destruction, where we see God working to preserve and encourage and claim and lift up God's people in spite of those things. Uh, which brings us to Revelation 7, right? Um, uh, John saw this vision of four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds, right? Preserving creation from uh, some kind of internal destruction. And God says, don't harm the earth or the sea until I have taken the time to heal and claim and call out my people so that they might be preserved. And so you see this vision of 144,000 people of Israel, those who have been sealed as a part of God's covenant people, uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel being claimed, being sealed. And you look at that and you think, well, that's an awful small number. I'm sure that there were more than 144,000 um, you know, Jewish faithful alive, even at the time of John. But what about now, even 2,000 years later? Like that, That's a really small number. And so we're reminded that, you know, this is apocalyptic imagery, and those numbers must mean something beyond being a literal 144,000 people, right? That, that they're representative of all of God's covenant faithful, particularly from that first covenant that God made with Abraham and his descendants. Um, and that, that's listed there in uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. But then when you start chapter, uh, excuse me, when you start verse 9, the vision continues. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. That very limited vision of 144,000 uh, Jews being sealed and claimed by God from the destruction and the chaos present in this world is then expanded to include a multitude that no one could even take the time to count from every nation, from every tribe, from every language, people from all over also being drawn into God's very presence. Um, there's a few things that are interesting about that. One, it's it's the entire story of Scripture, how God chose and called one person, a very small uh, representative of all humanity, and Abraham, and told Abraham that through him all nations of the world would be blessed. 
and that expanded then to the people of Israel when God brought them out of slavery in Egypt and claimed them as his people and then continued to say that through you all nations of the world would be blessed that all nations, tribes, and tongues through God's covenant people would be drawn into God's presence. And so it's not then just a future hope where all people receive um, the blessing of being in God's, God's presence, but it's something that Jesus had promised for us even now. We remember when he ascended into heaven, he looked at his disciples and said to them, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and throughout the ends of the earth. That the church would work in much the same way. That it would start in the central life and the territory of the people of Israel, and then expand to everyone, this great multitude that no one could count. And so it's a vision not just of the future hope where all people are drawn into God's presence, but it's also an image of the church being what God called it to be, God's blessing for the world, drawing all people into the presence of God through our work of pointing to Jesus. Uh, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. And so through an act of worship, this great multitude expands itself beyond a finite number of people to a multitude that no one can count. And that comes in the middle of a whole bunch of visions that, that you know, would, would keep people awake at night, really, if we sat and we thought about them too long because of the despair and the death and the destruction and the anguish that they, they convey. And it continues on. Um, the, these visions continue and you see more and more and you feel like how can anyone survive or find peace or wholeness um, or experience God's love in, in this, this world in which we live and then you find another vision of um, the people of God gathered around uh, you know God's people and remembering the blessings of God and singing God's eternal praises, even in the heavens, that that what happens in the presence of God is worship. Um, so much so that when you come to the end of the book of Revelation, somewhere around chapter 18 or 19, you see one of those places where it is talking about a future event. And that's the final destruction that comes as a result of God's judgment against the world. And that destruction is not levied against people. It's levied against the powers of this world that defy God and separate people from God. Sin, death, and the devil. Where God and God's uh, angels, right, particularly the, the angel Michael, lead God's forces to root out sin, death, and the devil from the face of the earth. And they are locked away into a deep, pit which we associate with hell and are um, kept there for eternity so that they can never again inflict pain and death and suffering on God's people. That's the final judgment and uh, what's happened over the course of you know 2,000 years is that we see that and, and it, it strikes us as something that's painful and that's agonizing and, and we put people in that place. And that's not at all what God is saying. God is saying that the peace and the justice and the wholeness that's offered in Jesus removes that suffering and that death and all the powers of this world that defy God from our presence. So that what happens in chapters 20 and 21 and 22 can be offered to all. And what, what John sees in the visions that are... are described in those chapters um, are where I think most people um, should focus when we look to the book of Revelation, but often they, they get under-focused because of the way that we as, as sinful, broken people like to focus on death and torment and torture. <laughs>
chapters 20, 21, and 22 talk about a vision of the great heavenly city coming down out of the clouds um, to create a new heaven and a new earth. And this holy city is at its center. And uh, even though there are walls all around the city, the gates are wide open for all to enter in. And you see this image of the great multitude of every tribe and tongue and nation that you heard about from chapter 7 entering into that city, that holy place. And as they enter in, there is no light in the city. There's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars, for those things have passed away. And uh, the throne of God that resides in the center of the city is the light of the world, so that there is never darkness again. That what radiates from its center, God, is light and life and wholeness for all people. And as they enter the city, they walk on streets, uh, yes, paved with gold, right? That it is in the richness of God's presence we experience all of life's joys and blessings. But there's also uh, lining a river that flows from the throne of God. Uh, trees. Trees that bear fruit of every kind all year round, um, that there's never a time where famine or hunger um, afflicts people in the presence of God. And the leaves of these trees that bear this fruit during all seasons, uh, it's said, are for the healing of the nations, right? That the leaves uh, not only provide shade, right, which is, is wonderful in a hot summer day, but the, the warfare, the destruction, the hostility that we experience in this world is overcome by the fruit that, that is in the presence of God. Reconciliation between people who um, have considered one another enemies, who have fallen away from a uh, loving relationship with one another. An end to all war and hostility is the image of what that holy city and life in it looks like. So that, right, the nations might be healed. Not just of our um, personal relationships, but also our physical ailments. So those, those horsemen that came, right, famine and plague and war and death, they're not found in that place. And so as much as that is a future hope for the final days of life in the resurrected Jesus... It's also the hope that God has for us now. That as God's people living in the world, we might be drawn into the presence of God in our life of worship and experience a community where hostilities are overcome, where the needs of the hungry and the poor are met, where illness and disease and death are treated and uh, we strive to heal them in faithfulness to God. And that even where death does persist in this time, uh, the life and the hope of God's future are promised and proclaimed all the more. And so it's really interesting then, when you take the whole of the book of Revelation, where it starts with John's vision and this letter to seven persecuted churches, and the end of the book where um, this final culmination of all God's good gifts come into being, we see time and time again how what this text is about is not about the end of the world in the sense that it's all going to be destroyed, uh, but it is about the end of the world, the purpose of the world, and the purpose of God's activity in it. That those who suffer, that those who experience death, that we who live and struggle against our own brokenness, our own sin, our own infirmities might be made whole because God has raised Jesus from the dead. That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what's common throughout this entire book is that while we tend to focus on the, the, the doomsday, the apocalypse, the common threads throughout the text are, one, it's all God's activity. God is the one who is bringing this creation to its fulfillment. And as God works to do that, 
the powers of sin, death, and the devil lash out against it because um, they're being cast out from a world that they were never intended to be in in the first place. Um, that Jesus is the one who lies at the center of that activity. Jesus is the lamb who opens the seal. Jesus is the one who resides at the center of the holy city, the object of our devotion and the one who draws us all into the center of that place. And that God's people, God's faithful people, the church, can be found participating in this cycle at each point of the journey throughout the book. The saints who gather under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord? The multitude gathered in Revelation 7 from every tribe and nation and tongue. And the great multitude gathered into the holy city at the end. Um, Throughout all of the other stories, Stuff that we focus on that uh, deals with death and chaos and destruction. The church is present in it all, offering a, uh, a witness to what God has done and is doing to raise us up out of those things. And the church does that through these visions by virtue of what John sees and says and, and writes down. The church does those things um, primarily through an act of worship. The saints under the altar, the multitude with the palm branches, and the multitude entering into the holy city at the end of the the, the book. And the angels and all of the powers and principalities and the heavenly host that we see elsewhere in the book. Every time we see God's covenant people coming up throughout these visions, What they're doing is they're worshiping. They're offering worship and praise to God. So that when we think about the end days and we think about heaven, whatever that may be, um, it's not about us getting to do whatever we want, right? Sit on a comfy couch and play video games all day, sitting on a cloud, fishing. Um, You know, the, the goal vision for what the church does in that place is the goal and the vision for what the church does now. Worship. Praise. Pointing to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Showing others the goodness of God in the ways that we are always drawn to and orienting ourselves toward the light of God poured out for us in Jesus. And so as you go and you you reflect on the beauty that the book of Revelation actually offers, in spite of the nightmarish things that keep us up at night, remember that that is not its purpose. Its purpose is to give comfort and assurance to a persecuted people that God has not abandoned us and that God is working in this world to right the wrongs of sin, death, and the devil. God is working in this world to raise up God's people into the fullness of God's desire for us and that on the last day God will remain faithful and a multitude that no one can count will be drawn into the presence of God. The last note about that is that it doesn't only say that that multitude are Christians or Jews. It's a multitude that no one can count. And so in God's vision for restoring all of creation, that multitude may very well be people who have actually um, never heard of the word of Jesus, never experienced God's goodness in their life, um, identified by the Christian faithful, but that God and God's mercy and God's love is working to save them anyway. And so that is also our hope. That as we continue to share ministry together as the church in a broken world, as we continue to point to our hope for what God is doing in Jesus, our limitations and our frailty and our suffering um, and all of the things that we experience in this world that are not from God will ultimately be overcome, not just for us, but for all those whom God chooses to seal and to love. It's a beautiful text, and so I do encourage you to spend some time with it. But remember that I encourage you to do so 
in the presence of God's Christian community. Because it is a book written to seven churches and a vision offered to a people, not just a person. Um, that as we turn to this text and we seek to learn from it and identify with God's work in the world as we see it played out through this text and in our lives. Um, it is a work intended for a community, not just for you or for I individually. And that's the wonderful beauty about it, right? That what God is doing is drawing us all up together into the presence of the Lamb who offered himself for us, who was raised from the dead for our behalf so that we too might live new life in him. And so for all these things, we look to the witness of scripture from Genesis to Revelation and give thanks to God that God has been at work through it all to give us life, to give us hope, and to give us peace. All in the risen Jesus.